Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, Discovering Aquatic Exercise in MS. My name is Peter Demiri. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Services for MSAA and will be your host for tonight's program. MSAA is proud to bring you information on this very exciting wellness approach to MS and very honored to have an expert in aquatics and MS with us for tonight's program. At this time, I would like to introduce our guest presenter, Linda Chiza. Linda is a physical therapist who earned her Doctor of Science degree in neurology in 2006 from Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. She is an assistant professor at Texas Women's University in Dallas and also works at a private outpatient clinic. Linda is actively involved in the American Physical Therapy Association and the American Board of Physical Therapy Residency and Fellowship Education. Linda enjoys helping people with MS improve their ability to perform daily activities. She is currently running two research studies, one looking at the effect of Tai Chi on people with MS and the other looking at the effects of aquatics on MS. Linda, thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise with us. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, tonight's webinar is part of MSAA's new national initiative known as Swim for MS. Swim for MS has two parts. The first part is a patient program. We are encouraging water-based exercise as an option for people with MS. The second part is a fundraiser where volunteers create their own unique swim challenges, which can be anything from swimming laps for pledges to having kids do cannonball jumping contests for a dollar a jump. The monies raised through Swim for MS fundraisers help support MSAA services, including this new aquatic exercise program. The goal for Swim for MS patient program is to increase awareness, understanding, and availability of swimming and aquatic exercise as a positive wellness opportunity for the MS community. And helping to raise national awareness about this important topic is MSAA's Swim for MS Ambassador, Missy Franklin. I love swimming and being in the water. For me, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way to exercise. As part of Swim for MS, MSAA is helping to bring water exercise programs to the MS community. For those who are interested, I encourage you to ask your doctor about aquatic exercise and MS. You might find real benefits from being in the water and have a lot of fun, too. See you in the pool. Well, MSA, of course, is extremely proud of Missy, not only for her incredible swimming accomplishments, but also for her active involvement in many charitable causes, including our Swim, swim for MS program. We're very much thankful for Missy and her outstanding support and wish her many years of continued success. I would also like to acknowledge and give special thanks to our Swim for MS sponsor, Genzyme, a Sanofi company. Through this collaborative sponsorship, MSAA is able to bring you tonight's webinar, as well as a variety of educational materials, including a new publication for patients on aquatic exercise and MS, a series of inspirational videos of people with MS who participate in aquatic exercise, a laminated flipbook of suggested aquatic exercises, and a special new website dedicated to aquatic exercise and MS. Please know that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the new website. However, the website is still under construction and plans are to launch in mid-March. So I do apologize for the delay, but MSAA will send email announcements of the launch of the new site when people can watch this archived program. This next slide is to give a quick overview of MSAA's additional programs and services. We encourage you to visit our website, mymsaa.org, or give us a call on our toll-free hotline at 1-800-532-7667. You can also send us an email or follow us on most social media platforms. One last slide before we begin our program. We also want to encourage you to be an active participant in tonight's webinar. 
we want to make this webinar as lively and as interactive as possible. So we are encouraging you to do a few things, and that would be to respond to some polling questions that will be included very shortly in the program. Submit your questions to Linda during the program via email by typing in the chat box on the lower left side. Please try to make your questions as general as possible so they can apply to the entire group. We hope to dedicate the last 10 minutes or so of the program to Q&A. And finally, we have a follow-up survey at the end of the program to let us know your thoughts about this and future webinars from MSAA. We really value your feedback, so we hope you take a minute to complete the survey and give us your thoughts. Now, just a note <coughs> excuse me, on the technical side, if you are experiencing any technical problems with the webinar, you can use the same chat box we just spoke about to type in your issue. There is an online moderator with us for the entire program and will respond to your chat to help correct the pro problem. So at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Linda as she begins tonight's presentation. Well, we're going to start tonight's talk about aquatic exercise in people with MS by talking about a, a guideline that was developed in 2008 by the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the United States Department of Agriculture. These two organizations developed actually two documents for Americans to improve health. One was the physical activity guideline, which I'm going to speak about briefly, and the other was the dietary guidelines for Americans. You can find both of these guidelines by Googling physical activity guidelines, and it will take you to the website where you can view the total document in its entirety on their web page. What the physical activity guidelines came out, and I'm sorry, I advanced the slide twice. The physical activity guidelines came out with recommendations for all Americans from children to aging adults. And what scientists have discovered is that regular physical activity can reduce the risk of many adverse health, health events. They also identified that some activity is better than none, but they also identified that it, as you increase your activity, so do the benefits. So the benefits compile one on top of the other and you have better improvements. The actual guidelines for adults are for us to participate in 150 minutes of activity per week. And this activity should be moderate intensity. If you break that down, that's a total of two hours and 30 minutes or 30 minutes a day for five days a week. These activities should include things like aerobic exercise, muscle strengthening, flexibility, and balance activities. And again, these benefits are with, will improve the health situation in everybody from children to older adults, and this includes individuals with chronic health conditions. Types of activities that are recommended, aerobic activities include things like walking, running, riding a bike, tennis, dancing, gardening, swimming and water aerobics or water activities are included under this category. Muscle strengthening includes using weights, TheraBand, body weight is resistance, and water resistance. Again, we see aquatic activity. Balance includes walking, running, changing directions, stepping up and down, and all of these activities can be done in the pool. And then flexibility recommendations include things like stretching, dancing, tai chi, and yoga. And again, all of these activities can be participated and conducted in a pool setting. You might say, but I have MS. Well, studies continue to support that exercise is good for people with MS. Studies have shown consistently there are improvements in strength, flexibility, balance, and aerobic conditioning or cardiovascular endurance. It's great for the heart and lungs, gait ability, and endurance activities in general. Some concerns, though, with people with MS have always been what about the heat generated with exercise? There is a phenomena called Uthoff's phenomena, 
which is when somebody exercises and their core body temperature increases, the person with MS can have what we call a pseudo-exacerbation, which is where there is a temporary sense of a loss of strength due to the increase in temperature leading to what appears to be some weakness in muscle groups that have been affected by MS. This may occur with exercise. However, studies have not proven this to be true for everybody. So we don't know if this is a true phenomena for everybody with MS or just certain people. Okay, thank you, Linda. I'm going to jump in, and we're going to start uh, asking a few polling questions for our audience. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we'd like to have uh, an engaged, active audience, and uh, having polling questions is certainly one great way to do it. And we just want to get a sense of uh, what people are doing and, and involving in, in exercise. So the first question is, do you routinely exercise as part of an approach to managing MS? And the answers are yes, no. And I put in when I can, just to understand that, you know, people have great intentions and, and mean to get to it, but, you know, you obviously can have good days and bad days, disruptions, travel schedules, you know, things of that nature. So what we try to do is uh, give, give people as many options as we can, and what we want is to have a, a good representation uh, of our clients and what they're doing for their exercise. So I'm going to give this just a, a few minutes to have everyone give us our, our answers. And it looks like the most results are, are in. And I'm going to put the results in. So I, it is good to, to see that people are routinely exercising. We have close to 57% of our audience, so that is excellent news. 18% uh, no, and 25% uh, when they can. So that is very good news to start. Okay, for the, for the no's out there, so I wanted to get a sense of the yeses and the no's. So for the no's, uh, if no, my primary reason for not exercising is afraid I'll feel worse, and as Linda mentioned, the heat, uh, maybe possibly injury uh, with with uh, the stress on the body for MS. Uh, next option is unsure what to do or how to start. Lack of resources. Uh, we definitely hear that uh, from time to time with uh, funding, transportation, uh, other issues, care partner issues. No time. That clearly uh, is across the board for a lot of people with exercising. Is, uh, they just say, I'd like to, just don't have the time. Uh, not emphasized by my doctor, and that's something that uh, we're going to talk a little bit later in the program about, but, you know, really having uh, the, the physicians on board with uh, recognizing the benefits of exercise and MS. And then the last is not interested. Um, so it looks like most results are in, and I will finalize them now. So afraid I might feel worse is uh, the top response. And unsure is, is second with lack of resources. Thank you for that. The next response or question, rather, is if yes, this is for the yeses out there who are exercising, what is the primary exercise you perform? And the options are walking, running slash jogging, cycling, uh, doing any type of sport, I put in a few examples, tennis, softball, golf, uh, really anything that you can think of, yoga, uh, tai chi certainly uh, are, are popular options for people with MS. Um, we put swimming and aquatic exercise classes in, really separating them. I mean, it certainly can be both, uh, but, you know, there are people who just do straight lap swimming uh, then there are more people who also do the aquatic exercise classes or known as vertical exercises in the pool. So with that, I am getting close to the results. And I see that uh, we have a pretty good range aquatic exercise. Look at that, 34%. That's excellent. This is a, this is a good group, Linda. We, we have, <laughs> we have good, 
good people on on board here. Uh, walking twenty five percent, excellent, uh, and cycling twelve and a half percent. Oh, and swimming eighteen percent, excellent. So, I'm glad to see that uh, we do have people engaged in in exercise and even uh, the aquatic piece of it as well. Uh, so that is good news, and uh, we're going to turn it over to Linda now for the rest of the program. We're going to talk now about why we might want to consider using the pool. Why is use of the pool so good for people with MS? Well, there are several characteristics with water that we're going to discuss. But one of the properties of using a pool is the water can help support you, and generally the water is cooler than our body temperature, which gives people with MS an excellent environment for exercise. Benefits associated from aquatic exercise in the pool include things like flexibility, mobility, including walking, range of motion, cardiovascular endurance or aerobic ability, again, the heart-lung function, fatigue level, meaning that fatigue level declines, improvements in strength, and improvements in balance. There have been minimal studies done on the use of aquatics in people with MS. However, any study that I have read, and I've read them all, I've read all 11, there have been improvements in all parameters that the researchers looked to identify. What about harm? We always worry about getting injured with exercise. And I think certainly in the past, even physicians were worried about people with MS exercising. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. The use of exercise in a pool doesn't pose any danger for people with MS. Regarding to increasing your symptoms or leading to exacerbation, we know now through research studies that, been, that have been conducted over the past 20 years, exercise does not cause an exacerbation of symptoms. Most of the studies that have been done on exercise in people with MS have identified benefits in multiple realms. Some studies have even included people who were in an act of exacerbation, and these individuals continued with the exercise program and showed improvement. So even somebody in an, exact, in an act of exacerbation or a flare-up was able to improve. And this specifically is related to the use of the pool. So in short, exercise in a pool can be beneficial for people with MS. The properties of water, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Water has characteristic of buoyancy, which is an uplift force of water. It reduces the influence of gravity. I even put some of my brand new surgical patients who have had their surgical incision has, re has completely healed, I'll put them in the pool first before I start exercising with them in my clinic because, I, because of the reduced gravity forces. There's also the viscosity or the thickness of water that we can consider. And that can give us benefit in helping us to move easier, or it can give us resistance if we want to work on some strengthening. Hydrostatic pressure is where fluid exerts pressure in all directions. And again, this can benefit people who are having difficulty moving, but we can use this property to give us resistance or to make the task a little bit harder. And again, water temperature. It is recommended by the National MS Society that the water temperature in a pool be around 80 to 86 degrees. However, I would want to say that these numbers have not been proven in scientific studies. In fact, there is a study that has been done using a pool that was 94 degrees temperature, and the individuals participating in this pool program had benefit and did not show any signs of Udhoff's phenomena or a pseudo-exacerbation from the heat. So we recommend a cooler pool. Most of the individuals that I work with who want to do an aquatic program prefer a cooler pool. Let's talk about the steps to take in order to, to participate in an aquatic program. Number one, you should always talk to your doctor. Is there any reason perhaps you should not be participating in exercise in the pool? 
Some examples might be an open wound, an infection that you're currently battling and trying to get over, or a healing area from some sort of an injury or a surgery. It's always good to consult with a physical therapist. A PT will conduct an examination to identify your abilities and your areas of challenges. A physical therapist can also help develop a baseline for your program. It's really important for you to understand and then your aquatics instructor to understand where you're starting. So what is your point of beginning in an aquatics program so that your level of physical fitness and exercise intensity and frequency can be determined from the get-go. Um, a PT exam will identify your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, PTs always rever re review your current state of health to determine the intensity of your exercise program, and the examination can help guide you to a nearby facility and the, in right, in the right instructor or program. This does not mean that you need to do a PT aquatic exercise program. This is just a part of you getting ready to start what can be a lifetime commitment to exercise and a rigorous exercise program that will help you to get better. So continuing with step two, it's, it's good to find a community-based program. Things that you want to consider are safety issues, such as does the pool have a handrail to help guide you in getting in and out of the pool? Does it have a non-slip surface both inside and around the pool as well as in the surface of the pool? Perhaps does it have a lift chair? We have people participating in our aquatic program who use a powered wheelchair as their primary method of mobility. We need to use a lift chair to help get them in the pool. Once they're in the pool, they're able to walk and stand and do all sorts of activities. Accessibility. Again, a lift chair the pool stairs and the railing, the pool that we use in our area has very graduated stairs, which I love because people who have difficulty with stairs can still get in and out of my pool. There's parking should be close to the facility so that you don't wear yourself out getting in or getting back to your car, and a dressing area should be large enough to accommodate a wheelchair or a walker if you need to use one. Location, location, location is the key. If the pool that you choose is an hour and a half away from you, it is less likely that you're going to continue with this program. The closer the pool to where you live or work, the more likely you are to participate. The activity and class should be led by a trained fitness instructor. It's often good to find a specific MS class. You may not be able to find a specific MS class, but you might find a class that has been developed for people with other sorts of chronic disability, like stroke or spinal cord injury. Those programs would be beneficial for you as well. The schedule of the pool activity should be at the time of day that suits you best. If you work 8 to 5, you can't go to an aquatic program that's at noon unless it's close to your work and you have enough of a lunch break. The pool temperature, again, should be in that 80 to 86 degree range. Um, there should be an open area around the pool. This is not to say that the pool needs to be outside, but it should be a, a big enough area that the air, the ambient air around the pool is not so warm and it's really important to have an appropriate instructor. Instructors can be personal trainers, certified strength and conditioning specialists, certified aquatics instructors. They might be certified in aquatic fitness. They may be certified in aquatic therapy and rehab. There are many organizations that do offer certifications, such as the Aquatic Exercise Association, Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute, and the Aquatic Section of the American Physical Therapy Association. An aquatic specialist needs to maintain their certification through attending continuing education courses. 
This means that they have to keep their training up to date, be aware of new standards or guidelines that might have been published, and maintain their certification. Um, the specialist needs to be knowledgeable in the special populations that he or she works to understand the condition, the exercises that are appropriate, as well as the intensity, the duration, and the frequency of those exercises, and also understanding the impact of the water on the person. There are a large variety of type of programs available across the United States, but the program needs to be goal-oriented to you, individually determined so that it benefits you, at an appropriate pace and intensity, and most importantly, it should be fun for you. There are multiple types of aquatic exercise, and we're going to talk about briefly a few. Now, you don't need to necessarily find a specific type of exercise in order to benefit you, a person with MS. But here, there are some techniques out there. Some of these techniques you'll see in the physical therapy realm. So you might use these techniques if you're working with a physical therapist who's doing an aquatic program. Others are available in some community-based programs as well. So let's talk about the Hallowick technique. It's usually performed as an individual technique with one instructor or therapist and one individual. It's working on balance control and using movement activities such as swimming, balance, transfers, walking, and reaching in order to accomplish certain tasks and in, in order to achieve certain goals. Watsu, or aquatic body work, is based on Zen Shiatsu. It is an individual passive technique that combines stretching, soft tissue mobilization, slow, gentle, rotational movements, which we know to be very relaxing to the body, and it is very effective to help stretch tight and restricted soft tissues. So for those of you out there that might have a problem with increased muscle tone, this type of a program would be very beneficial for you. Bog Ragaz is the use of PNF, which is proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Great technical terms that come from the physical therapy realm. PNF basically is moving the body in ways that it was designed to move. When we move our body through space, most of our movements are done in a diagonal pattern. So we use this technique to work with somebody in the pool, and the person may be floating with a neck collar and rings around the hips, arms, and legs as they're trying to move their legs and arms in a certain pattern. It is very effective for strengthening, for stability or core strengthening, as well as control of the body. I Chi is one of my favorite techniques to use in the pool, and it's a modified form of Tai Chi that is performed in the water. It combines slow, fluid motions that are paired with breathing patterns. Breathing is one of the hallmark key components of an I Chi water program. The emphasis is on the ability to increase mind-body awareness as you're moving through the water, maintaining your balance, and doing more and more complex movements to work on strengthening flexibility and balance activities. There is also what we call the task-oriented approach. And this is where you might be performing functional tasks or skills in the water. So for strengthening and functional preparation, you might do some stair climbing in the water. This is an exercise that I love to use with people with MS. The water helps support you, but you're able to do the activity, and you can do it multiple times, gaining in strength and confidence. We use upright postures with appropriate trunk control and stabilization for all of the tasks that we choose to use. The focus is on quick and reciprocal patterns with progressions. We might do things like jogging in place or jumping up and down on a weighted box that's in the pool, in the bottom of the pool. We may do step-ups or step-overs, but we'll use different tasks that could be performed outside of the water as well. 
we're going to incorporate walking, balancing, stepping, reaching, lifting, stairs, and jumping in this type of exercise. Aqua stretch is a type of aquatic exercise that incorporates dynamic stretching and intuitive movement with myofascial and soft tissue mobilization. Myofascial and soft tissue mobilization are techniques used by physical therapists and massage therapists to help lengthen and relax tissues. This type of therapy or exercise would be used to help decrease edema, pain, and to help improve or limit restrictions to movement. It does use a series of body and limb positions and holds that are performed by the instructor. Again, this is a one instructor, one participant method. So this is not done generally in a group class. Another type of aquatic exercise is called the unpredictable command technique, which is a series of familiar as well as unfamiliar movement patterns that are performed quickly. What what happens with this technique is we're trying to increase body awareness through your senses, the sense of knowing where your body is in space, the sense of identifying speed of movement, direction changes, and resistance that you might encounter. It can also increase balance and equilibrium reactions, which are your balance responses. As we lose our balance, through our lifetime, we have developed equilibrium responses that help keep us upright and prevent us from falling. This technique specifically focuses on working on some of those. This technique also improves coordination with multiple different activities. We can talk strictly about endurance or aerobic training where we're using larger muscle groups to elevate the heart rate and produce a cardiovascular training effect. This is what we generally call aerobic or endurance training. It is one of the recommendations from the physical activity guideline that all ages and all levels of ability should be completing and performing 150 minutes a week. These activities can include walking, running, jumping, treadmill, and there are some aquatic programs that have a treadmill that is in the pool, cycling, and this type of program should include a warm-up period, a high-intensity period, and a cool-down period. And this is where you'd want to work at 55 to 90% your heart rate max for about 15 to 60 minutes, depending on your tolerance. This is where a physical therapy exam can help the aquatic instructor identify where you should start with your aerobic endurance training, what percentage of max heart rate you should be working, and perhaps how long you should be participating in this type of a program. As you get stronger and better, we can generally spread out the length of the program and increase your intensity so you're working at a higher heart rate max. Resistance training, we all know about this. This is improving strength, but it can also be used to improve endurance. You can use the water as resistance. The faster you move in the water, the more it pushes against you. You can use equipment such as mitts, paddles or fins, buoyant hand bars, which are challenging to push down into the water but will float up to the top on their own, kickboards, cuffs that are weighted, weights designed for the pool, noodles, and TheraBand, which is the elastic stretchy band that you can use both in the water and out of the water. The use of games or sports is also very beneficial for improving health, aerobic fitness, strength, coordination, and balance. Games like basketball, volleyball, or even competitive races are great activities to do in the pool. So does exercise increase the rate of exacerbation? I'm going to tell you again, no, it does not. There, has been, there have been no studies identified that say exercise produces exacerbations. That is not the case. We know that people with MS can exercise, should exercise, but do need to be guided through the exercises that they can and should do. So how should somebody with MS exercise in the pool? 
It's really important when you're starting out, especially if you haven't been doing exercise recently, to intersperse your activity with rest. We need to allow the muscles to rest and recover before we ask them to do another demanding activity. It should be at your specific level. That's where a PT exam becomes very important in helping you determine where you should be starting. And it really should be with guidance and supervision at first. Once you're more comfortable in the water, have a well-developed program, there's no reason that you can't take that program and do it on your own in another pool somewhere else. Again, we can talk about Uthoff's phenomena, which is an increase in core body temperature of just 0.5 degrees Celsius, which has been shown in some individuals to lead to a 40% loss of motor function or motor strength temporarily. And this is for a short period of time. It hasn't been identified that this occurs in everybody with MS. So it's important to use a pool with a cooler temperature that will keep your core body temperature stable. Um, a pool offers a supportive, protective environment. There is a support of the water. There's reduced strain on the joints. And if you fall in the pool, you fall really slowly so you can practice those balance responses and recovery responses. Individuals with MS of all levels can participate. So somebody, let's say, who has mild or no symptoms, those individuals can get in and pretty assertively work out in the pool. Let's say level two, where there's more physical or motor limitations with the need for an assistive device outside of the pool. You could more than likely get into the pool and exercise without using an assistive device, which can really help your confidence and your feeling of being a healthy, strong person. Level three, those individuals with greater functional difficulty who perhaps use a wheelchair or a scooter, they too can benefit from aquatic activity in a pool because of the supporting nature of the water itself. And we find that people, even with a fairly significant level of disability, can get in and exercise rigorously at their own level and really feel the benefit of the activity. A good MS aquatic program will have a pool that's accessible either through a ramp or a hydraulic lift chair or stairs that are easy to go up and down. It should have accessible parking, accessible dressing rooms and restrooms, meaning that they're large enough to accommodate a power wheelchair if that's what you use. There should be trained or certified instructors. A cooler temperature in the pool is what we recommend. And there should be personal assistance for individuals in the program if needed. So we go back to basics, the physical activity guidelines. We have 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise each week. Again, that breaks down to 30 minutes a day for five days a week. But let's say you participate in an aquatic pool program for an hour a day, three times a week. You have met that minimum standard plus you've added on a few extra minutes in your week. Anything in bouts of 10 minutes count. So, for example, if you can walk outside for 10 minutes, but that's all you can do, that 10 minutes of activity, walking, counts towards your 150 minutes of moderate exercise as, as recommended by the physical activity guideline. The use of an MS Aquatics program can allow you to achieve the standards set in this guideline in a safe and supported manner, doing exercises that will benefit you individually so that you can see improvements in strength, improvements in endurance, improvements in flexibility, range of motion, balance, and improvements in your self-confidence. So how do you get started? The Multiple Sclerosis Association of America has developing aquatic exercise information, resources for MS healthcare instructors, sorry, healthcare professionals and aquatic fitness instructors and a national database of pool facilities specific to MS. This list may not be all inclusive, but it's a great way to start. 
the National MS Society chapters may have a list of MS Aquatics programs in your area. Contact local recreation centers to ask if they have any specific programs, either specific to somebody with MS or specific to somebody perhaps with a chronic um, medical health condition. So everybody needs to exercise, including people with MS and other chronic conditions. The physical activity guidelines state the minimum recommendations. I'm encouraging you to at least meet those guidelines, but I would love to see you exceed those guidelines so that you really feel like you are doing something yourself to benefit your state of health. I think when faced with a chronic illness, it is important for us as individuals to try to take control of some aspect of our health and well-being. Exercise is one way that we can do that. Specifically, an aquatic exercise program can be very beneficial for people with MS for many areas of their health and improving their state of wellness and well-being. So take charge. Talk to and go see your physician. I know you have to do that regularly. Talk to your physician about an aquatic exercise program. Schedule a meeting with a physical therapist. If you need assistance finding a physical therapist in your area, you can go to the American Physical Therapy Association. They have an icon for find a PT. The type of PT that would be beneficial for you is a PT that has neurologic experience since MS is a neuro neurologically based disease. Then you want to find a program in your area. Talk to the certified instructor about your limitations, what would best fit your needs, what your goals are related to aquatic exercise and your lifestyle, and then have fun with your program. So there are resources available for you at MSAA and the National MS Society as well. So now we would like to take the time to see if anyone has any questions that they would like to like to ask us. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to start by thanking you, Linda. That was an excellent presentation full of great information and, and real good insights into this great topic. So uh, thank you very much for that. And I have quite a few questions that came in, and I will try to get to them all. And I see even more coming in, so I'll do my best to kind of read and, and write down some more. Uh, but really the first question that I want to ask is really a very simple, direct, basic question. And the person says, I don't know how to swim but can I still do aquatic exercises? The answer to that question is yes. Aquatic exercise does not ever have to involve swimming. In most of the cases, the exercise program is conducted in a pool where the water at most is chest high. So the water provides you uplift and support, but also gives you resistance. You never have to put your head under the water or do anything where your feet are not supported by the bottom of the pool. Okay, excellent. Um, next question, if I join an aquatic exercise class, should I tell the instructor that I have MS? In my opinion, I think it's very important to let the instructor and anybody who's there to assist as well, to let them know that you do have MS. I think it's very important for them to understand that you may have special considerations that may be different than other individuals. It's also important for you to let them know how, how much assistance you need because of the MS. The more, that, the more information you can give the instructor, the better designed your specific program will be so that you can have great success in the aquatic exercise program. Yeah, very true. And, and as Linda mentioned, as part of our Swim for MS initiative, uh, MSA is working to increase knowledge and awareness at all levels. So obviously for the MS community about this topic, but we also are working with a variety of aquatic fitness 
organizations and their instructors, and we're trying to get them to understand the needs of people with MS and the issues of fatigue and taking rest breaks during classes and uh, some of the range of motion and mobility issues. So we are, we are committed to this program, and we are going to do our best to to raise awareness at all levels so it really does make for a, a good fit and a good match for folks. Uh, another question is, does a prescribed aquatic exercise program, uh, will that be covered by insurance? That's a really good question. If, for example, you were to start with a physical therapist who happens to have a pool in their clinic, you might start your PT aquatic exercise program as a part of your physical therapy exercise program, which is covered by your insurance. Now, that is just the beginning, though. You will get to the level where you're either independent or you need to go to the next level of your aquatic exercise program, which would be to be in a community-based facility. I personally like community-based facilities more because they are significantly less expensive and they are available to you as long as that facility is open, however many days a year that they're open, and they offer the, the program generally in an ongoing manner. So your aquatic therapy program will only be covered by insurance if it is a part of the physical therapy regimen. Otherwise, it's considered a fitness center or an exercise class that you might choose to take on your own. Okay, very good. Uh, someone uh, typed in, there's not an MS-specific exercise program at my pool, but there's an arthritis exercise class. Is that a good option? That's another really good question. The one consideration that I want you to think about with an arthritis-based exercise program is generally people with arthritis do not like a cool pool. So in an organization or a facility where they're conducting an arthritis-based program, their pool temperature might be warmer than 86 degrees. It could be anywhere from maybe 86 up to 90 degrees in temperature. So you might approach that cautiously. However, again, I want to emphasize that studies have not shown the specific temperature that somebody with MS needs to be exercising in when related to an aquatic exercise program. So my, my suggestion to you would be to go visit the program, see how warm the environment itself is, how warm is the room, and then ask about the temperature of the pool. In my physical therapy clinic, we have a pool in our clinic, and our water temperature is probably 88 degrees. The people that I work with who have MS don't like to get in my pool, not because the water temperature is so warm, but our pool is in a smaller area, and our ambient room temperature is too warm for them. So they prefer that I recommend they go to and a community-based program where the pool is larger in a larger area. So there are some considerations. An arthritis-based program is a good program as long as you can tolerate the environment in which it is being conducted. Okay, so that's a good point. So it's not just the temperature of the pool, it's the, the conditions and, I guess, the humidity uh, of the, uh, the pool center as well, right? That's absolutely right. Okay. Okay. Uh, what are good exercises to increase your heart rate? There are many different types of exercises that you can do that will increase your heart rate. We all know of, of aerobic activities, things like walking, running, biking, stair climbing, jogging. Those things will all inc increase your heart rate. Now, what sometimes people forget is any time we do exercises that include our our arms, that will increase our heart rate at a faster rate than even those exercises that use our legs. So a good example is you're in the pool and you're working out using the foam weights where you have to resist the water to push the foam weight going down and you have to control the weight coming up. The faster and the harder you do that activity, the higher your heart rate is going to be. So even some arm exercises, many arm exercises, can be aerobic exercises as well. 
So looking at any time you move your body in a way that is for a longer amount of time, say five to ten minutes, and you're consistently doing something with either your arms or your legs, then you're going to increase your heart rate. If you work hard enough, you'll get into the aerobic training zone, which is anywhere between 55 and 90% of your max heart rate. Very good. And before I jump into my next question, I just wanted to uh, remind people that uh, we'll have this webinar recorded and then archived uh, on our Special Aquatics Online Center in March. Uh, we're launching it uh, in the middle of March, and we'll send out announcements uh, to not only people that register for the program, but you know through all our uh, email and uh, website communications as well. And you know, with that, we're we're producing a lot of content. So as I mentioned, we have a, a booklet that, that's coming out soon. On tap is to have a laminated flip book of a variety of different exercises. Uh, that probably will come online a little bit later, uh, maybe uh, May or June, but we are working hard to get uh, a lot of this content together. And uh, we're going to have another webinar uh, probably in late May, and that is uh, for healthcare professionals, again, physical therapists, aquatic fitness instructors, uh, to again raise that bar and let people know uh, about aquatics and, and specifically people with MS and their, and their issues. Um, Another question is, um, you know, who is the best person to contact regarding aquatic exercise? Is it a doctor? Is it an MS center? Is it a PT? Who, who would you recommend, Linda? Well, I think that you need to go through the steps. If you yourself are really interested in participating, you, of course, need to go see your doctor to make sure it's okay. But that's for your own health and wellness. Uh, good people to contact are to use the resources that we spoke about, the MSAA, the National MS Society, your local chapters of um, your local MS Association chapters, if you have any, would be great places to, to look and see if there are, there are listed aquatic exercise programs. Other resources that you can use if you have a local area physical therapy clinic that works and sees people with MS, they may have some resources. Your MS physician may also have some resources for aquatic therapy activities, or they may not. It depends on how involved they are in, in the um, MS population in their area. Health facilities, fitness facilities, YMCAs, and local area Recreation centers may have some information about aquatic therapy programs that they have, aquatic exercise programs. They have some information on um, specific MS-related programs. Um, if there is a university in your area that has a physical therapy or an occupational therapy program associated with it, they may also have some information to identify aquatic therapy programs in your area. So there are many ways that you can go about looking for appropriate facilities and programs. Excellent. And we have time for one last question. And, and I know in part of our presentation and in our Q&A, you mentioned a lot about the community pools and the whys and the classes. But we've gotten questions about people who have uh, backyard pools and, and people want to know if, they, if there are suggestions for exercises that they could do, and, and I guess, um, you know, even for the pools that are round or oval and, you know, might not be conducive to swimming laps. So uh, any suggestions for some of the exercises for people with their backyard pool? There, there are a lot of activities that you can do if you happen to have your own pool. Um, there, I think the best method for finding a great program for you individually would again to be to consult with your physician and go see a physical therapist who has worked with or enjoys working with people who do have MS. That physical therapist should be able to develop an exercise program that you can do in your pool based on your level of fitness. 
And this program, again, is going to include things like walking or standing or stepping. It may involve some lower extremity exercises, some upper extremity exercises. It may involve the use of kickboards, which are very inexpensive to purchase, as well as noodles, also very inexpensive to purchase. It may involve the use of a life vest, for instance, where you can float in the deep end of the pool and kick your legs as if you're riding a bike. So I think the best way to get the most appropriate program for you would be to consult with a physical therapist. And it may be a one-time visit for a physical therapy examination so that that physical therapist can develop the aquatics program that is the most appropriate for you at your current level. And it's great to exercise in your own pool. You only have to walk out your back door and get in. Yeah, that's great. Well, again, what an excellent presentation, Linda, and a great Q&A as well. Uh, and this brings us to the conclusion of our program, Discovering Aquatic Exercise in MS. Uh, as mentioned, this webinar, uh, with a lot of a variety of uh, resources, will be available, but not that soon. And it'll be in a couple weeks, and it'll be on our new dedicated website, swimforms.org. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Linda for her time and very informative presentation tonight, as well as uh, Genzyme, a Sanofi company, for sponsoring the webinar tonight, as well as many other additional Swim for MS projects. Please be sure to complete the very brief survey that immediately follows the conclusion of this program. And once again, on behalf of MSAA, thank you so very much for joining us.